Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, we're going to be looking at, oh, at another video on Linux internals, but this time we're going to be looking at the tools that you need to manage PCI and USB. So stay tuned right after this. We're looking at the actual uh, the actual things that are available to us. We need to understand how to uh, how to gather the information that we need to identify a board, how it's being used, what driver is. What we need to understand is we need tools that allow us to figure out who's the vendor, what's the device, what's the class of the device, so that we can use it to. Well, for example, I might want to take a graphics card and share it with a with a virtual machine. So I, I might want to just push that over there and let that virtual machine have at it, have, have total use of the card. Or I might just try to figure out, I, I've got a malfunctioning device and I don't understand what's going on with it. I can't get to it. It doesn't appear uh, as a piece of hardware. And so maybe I have a video, I have a driver that's not working. So, so that's what we're going to be looking at today are the tools that we need on PCI and USB to manage the uh, all of that information, then get it back to us so that we understand what's going on better with our system. So the command that you have for PCI is LSPCI. If you just go to the command line and enter LSPCI by itself, it will list, a, it'll just provide you with a full list of all the devices it finds uh, on your system. But you won't know, are these supported by my kernel? Are they active? Are they being used? I mean, are they working? You don't know that, but you do know uh, that you have this list and what vendors that it discovered from the PCI ROM. So how does it, uh, We last time we talked about the uh, SATA uh, and the devices that are listed in dev, and we looked at how the kernel show the devices and they're totally nonsense. Well, the same is true here, that your uh, the PCI interface is totally nonsense too, how do we get the information that's being displayed here? Where does LSPCI get that? Well, as it turns out, there is a file that support that is shipped with your Linux kernel that has, it's called uh, PCI.IDS or PCI IDs. Though you'll find it in probably one of two locations that there might be some differences on your distro. But uh, the two most common that I have found are user share hardware data or HW data and the other one is uh, user share miscellaneous or MISC, uh, where you can find that file. It's pretty big, but it does list every manufacturer, every device that that manufacturer makes, and the class that that belongs to. So, <laughs> yeah. So um, there's also a third place you can find the file, which is in your local directory, and that might be there. It's a cached copy of the file. Why is there a cache copy of the PCI IDS file? Well, you can enter a command lspci minus q, and that will go out to the PCI IDS server and refresh uh, the one you have in your local home directory. It won't modify the one that's in user share. That should be obvious as to why, because that file could be overwritten by an update to your system. So yeah, so it keeps a cache copy in your home directory. So what does it look like if I just ask for the LSPCI by numeric value? So I get this, and there's a column of numbers here that has the kernel ID and the kernel assigned device, and then the next, the, the, the third row is the, uh, well actually, it, yeah, it's the third row where it begins with 8086 colon 1237. So the first one is the vendor ID, the second one is the device ID. So you'll notice that I have some device IDs down there where it says 1AF4. So we're going to play with those today. We're going to look at those and see what that is. I don't know who that vendor is, but we're going to go look it up. So what I need to do is go open up my PCI IDS file and look for that particular string, so 1AF4. And I found it, and it's owned by Red Hat because this is on a virtual machine. Those are the virtual device drivers that are used for, well, a number of things, your network device, your block devices, your memory, uh, your console, and so forth. There, as you can see there, there's a whole bunch of them that are listed. So <clears throat> what can I do with that information? Well, 
I can I can then I can then take it and I can go out and look for just the devices that match that vendor ID. So I can do an LSPCI minus D and I can do one AF four. I have to do a backslash to escape the the semi the excuse me the colon. And when I do that, and colon is required by the way on that command. So I'll get a listing of all of the devices that match that device ID. There is a variant of this where you can put in a minus N before that, LSPCI minus N, and then a minus D, and then the command. And what you get there is you'll get the numeric value plus the match, plus the filter on the, the vendor. If you put in a minus NN, you'll get both the kernel ID and the hardware information that's in the PCI IDS file. So, yeah, there's a, you check out the LSPCI command because there's an awful lot you can do with it. One of the other things you can do is if you're trying to troubleshoot and figure out whether or not this device has a driver in your kernel, you can do an LSPCI minus K, and that will show you whether or not this particular device has either a kernel driver, which means it's baked into the kernel, or there is a module that is inserting a device driver. We'll talk more about modules in a future video, but for today, it, just think of it, it doesn't matter. As long as you've got an entry for either or, or both, you're fine. That, that driver is working and functioning with that device. So the other thing is, uh, uh, the next thing is USB and LSUSB. So you have a kind of a similar way there. You can put in LSUSB by itself, and you'll get a listing of devices on your machine, but you won't get any other information. You won't know at what speed those are running at. You won't know what class they are offering. So yeah, or, or anything like that. So if you put in LSUSB minus T, you'll start to get information about what hub it's attached to, and USBs have to be attached to a hub. Then you'll get a list of the devices that are under that particular hub, and the hub will show you the maximum speed that it can run at, and then under that, it'll show you the device that'll be the number to the far right, like the 10,000 at the top on bus port uh, four, bus port four, bus four, port one, and it'll show 10,000 megabits per second. So that would be a, uh, a USB 3.2 device, or it could be a Thunderbolt 3 device as well. And then you have below that, you have uh, uh, you have um, bus one, port one, dev one, and underneath there you'll start to see devices attached to it. Now this is off my laptop. It has kind of an interesting uh, way of handling these things. So you might think, wait, if I attach a, U so, all right, let, let's define what, what we're talking about here on the devices first. So there's a number of drivers that have come uh, into play for uh, Linux over time. So you have the OHC1 and UHC1 driver. That's the oldest one that supports USB 1.1. Those maximum speeds there are only 12 megabits per second. Not particularly stellar or quick. The next one after that was the EHCO driver and that supported USB 2.0. And then you had the XHCI driver that supports uh, USB 3. Now 3X is what it should say. So that can either be 5 or 10 gig, and uh, you'll see those there. Now on my laptop, it has kind of a unique way of handling the uh, hub. So you have some hubs which handle uh, USB uh, 2 speeds only, and some that handle higher ones. So what it does is is that if it senses a device that needs speeds that are faster than 480 megabits per second, it just attaches it. It's a soft mount, so it just attaches it to the higher speed hub. So, and you'll see one that's attached here to one of the hubs called Port 2 Dev 2, and that's a class mass storage device, and it has a driver that's UAS, and that's operating at 5,000 megabits per second or 5 gig. So let's talk about that one for just a second. So. A USB that attaches a SCSI device, so it, it, even though it's, a, it's an internal device, it's not really a SCSI device, it's a SATA, uh, it is a SATA device, but uh, it actually has a controller in it that converts from SATA to uh, USB. So there's a driver called UAS, 
and UAS permits uh, transfer rates to occur at above 480 megabits a second. So uh, if you find that you don't have that driver UAS defined in there, then your drive speeds are not optimal. They're not going at the full rate that the drive can supply. So what do you do? Well, and I have encountered SATA to USB controllers that don't support UAS, and but they're but they usually will tell you if they do or not. I mean, assuming that it doesn't, they don't list it at all. But if they do support UAS, they usually tell you that they do. So I would skip the ones that don't tell you, because you probably are going to get one that only supports USB speeds of 480. Uh, if it says it's UAS, now again, I have run into ones that say they've done UAS and they don't. But hey, you got to believe something. I'll just send those back when I encounter those. But the the larger names usually are, you know, if they tell you it's UAS, it is UAS. So yeah. Anyway, uh, that standard was introduced to provide the protocol support for higher speeds on USB 3, and it was added in uh, kernel 3.15 and above. So it's been around a while. And it's not likely that you won't find one on your side that doesn't support it. So what other, then we also mentioned class devices. We talked about mass storage there for a moment. So what are some of the class devices and what are those? So there's human interface devices or HIDs, H-I-D. Those are usually keyboards or mice. Uh, there's other devices that fall into that category as well. Numeric keypads, for example. Uh, there's also communication devices that you can plug into your USB like Ethernet. There's some Wi-Fi, Bluetooth so forth. Uh, uh, serial devices can be plugged in as well uh, into that, and those would appear as communication devices. There's also, as we just saw, mass storage, and that could be a SATA device or a CD or a DVD as well. There's also audio devices, and those can be sound cards or MIDI cards, maybe speakers or microphones. Uh, there, there's also one called the uh, infrared uh, data a uh, adapter, and those can be, uh, those can support infrared devices that either read or send uh, so that they can control it, act as a TV remote, for example. So the other types you have are, of course, printer devices. Now, if your printer is plugged into a network, obviously it's not going to appear in this USB list. But if it is plugged into your laptop or your PC as a USB device, then yeah, it would appear. Uh, you also have video devices, and those include webcams and video capture devices, uh, etc. So, what else can you do with this? Well, I can filter the LS USB list, and you can you can uh, you can see here that I'm looking for a specific device. So, if you look down on the first time I ran it with just LS USB by itself. And I noticed that there's a Intel Corp AX200 Bluetooth that's down close to the bottom. It's device 5. And I'm looking for, I just want to filter that one. So I could put in LS USB minus D, put in the 8087 uh, colon. Now that's a pattern match this time. So I don't have to have the forward slash in there. I'm just matching to see if. If, uh, if, I, if, if the 8087 appears on the left side of the colon and not the right. So I don't want those. I want the actual vendor, not the, not the device number. So um, that's why I'm doing that. You can also combine it with a uh, uh, LSUSB, uh, other, other commands on the LSUSB. And again, uh, if you want additional information, like you want the numeric value and so forth, or the minus T, you can put that in there as well. And then you'll get the minus T for just that device. So, yeah. If you're not much for the command line, there's also one that works with a, as a graphical user interface called USB View. You'll probably have to install that one. What's nice about the USB view is you'll notice this one is marked in red. There's unknown devices here. So I have one that is actually missing a device driver. It happens to be a finger uh, a fingerprint reader. So on my version of the kernel, that fingerprint reader is not supported. There is a driver that I can install, however, to fix that. But yeah, it's not there. So, it, But be careful with this one because you can configure the devices, which could result in you not ever being able to access that device again until either you fix what you did or you reinstall the kernel. 
So, so let's wrap things up. What did we learn? So we talked a little bit about PCI and some of the commands you can use to list how it gets the information that it displays to you. And then we talked a little bit about LSUSB. We talked about how to determine the speed that it's operating at, its requirement for a hub. And also, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the, the device classes and how those are used and how they're managed. So next time, what we're going to look at is message passing and DBUS. And if we have time, we'll look at the kernel modules and how those come into play uh, in a little bit more depth. If I can't fit that into the same video, then I'll just, I'll just spin it off to its own, its own video, and we'll do that later. So with that, I hope you enjoyed this video today. And if you did, please like and subscribe. Uh, leave a comment below as to uh, the, some of your favorite commands that you like to gather information on your systems from. Uh, because uh, maybe that'll help others understand where to go look when they're trying to troubleshoot things like my Wi-Fi isn't working, my Bluetooth isn't working, my network card isn't working. Yeah, so, yep, that'll help you do that. And the newer your machine is, just remember, with Linux, you're probably in at least a two-month delay before your driver may appear uh, in the kernel. So if you just go run out and buy the latest hardware that just came out yesterday, Chances are it will support Linux, particularly when you get into laptops. You'll find most of the laptop vendors like to change <laughs> they like to change vendors uh, for the various devices in the laptop, like the wind. So yeah. Anyway, that's all I had for today. Hope to see you again in the next video. Bye for now.